So, um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, it's an honor to be surrounded by, by family. It's really a gift to have a community uh, of people that believe in what you have to say and the change that you're trying to put out in the world. And so I'm just really, really thankful that you're all here and that you would take time out of your days to, um, to support me. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I'm rather dreadfully sick right now, so I'm going to try and keep the energy up. Um, so let's just dive into it. So this right here is uh, my most recent chapbook, Billion Burning Dreams, uh, and the collection uh, of poems all trace my mental health journey from uh, patient to professional, and uh, whatever that means. Um, and so I'm going to be sharing works from that, that, that book, um, and there'll be an opportunity afterwards to uh, buy some digital copies. I was hoping to have some physical copies, but my printer decided to be on the fritz. So I, do, I will have some digital copies available for folks where you just give me your email and I'll just send it out to you uh, by, the, by uh, the end of the weekend. So, um, so the first poem I wanted to share, uh, it was inspired by my, um, my, my childhood experience being diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And that's going to be sort of the, that, that narrative of my own experience is going to be through line throughout the whole, the whole piece. I'm going to talk a lot about the history of mental health treatment in the United States, or at least bits and pieces, um, and hopefully arrive at uh, a larger question about how can performance uh, shift that, uh, that history, both speaking to the legacy of that history rather than trying to erase it, and how we can change. So uh, this first piece is called The Cure Mentality, and then we'll sort of dive into everything. I was born a broken tinker toy. The pieces of my mind configured to not fit quite right. Great divides separating synapses whose dendrites reached like desperate fingers for siblings falling away. Those hands held secrets. The neurons whispering, I am not broken. Doctors tried to fix me up. Patch up the perfectness of my disorder. Fed me medications that damn the divides between my skittering nerves, but they only served to flood the majesty of my grand canyons because my mind wasn't falling away. It was flying. When you strip away the bells and whistles of our brains, rearrange the cogs and play with the knobs, you'll discover the world has changed. The mind is just a filter through which reality is fed. What you see is one of only many worlds I feel inside my head. This moment has a texture. Every sound has a voice. I can't read the furrows on your face because my brain can't filter out the noise. Your social cues confuse me. But do you know all the names of the president's wives? I can rattle off to you the history of music between 1932 and 1989. I obsess, I know, but there are patterns everywhere. Let me describe to you the streets of London, even though I've never been there. Don't be scared. I'm not. I don't talk much because my brain can't stop to think. I promise you I'm in here, kept warm by the stimming I'm swaddled beneath. My mind is hyper aware of the world. That is the gift that I have been gifted to overperceive the subtle vibrancies that permeate existence. You see, that blue is not the only blue. Numbers have feelings too, I know. I can't control this world of mine, but neither can any of you. Because I was born a broken tinker toy. No physician could force my pieces to fit. The way the light dances over my grand canyons could never be muted by medicine. You can't cure me of me. My perfection does not exist on a spectrum. You don't know the comfort of a repetitive movement. My light is always bright. Whole worlds exist between my gyre and sulky. If you're wondering where I am, I'm playing there. I'm flying. Thank you. Yeah. coined by this guy, uh, Eugene Bleuler, in 1911, and he was working with uh, what was called at the time uh, dementia precox, or precocious madness. And um, he, he was the first one to sit there and say, well, um, I think what, what we're seeing here is folks that are having a schism with reality. They're, they're breaking with their understanding of, 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 of what we agree on as reality. Um, and so he came up with uh, these two terms, uh, schizophrenia, uh, and autism. And autism was the most severe form of schizophrenia. He, he saw it as being sort of like this complete break with reality where a person sort of collapses inward on this fantasy world and is only able to cope with an uncopable reality by making up their own metaphors and um, wishful thinking and all this jazz. 
So, um, for my own uh, childhood experience, uh, I was uh, I had I had carried both diagnoses at one point or another. Um, when I was very young, in elementary school, I started having uh, what were called sado seizures. These um, these moments where I would disassociate and I would go into these tantrums on the floor. And what it kind of felt like was being sort of like punched out of your own body um, and not being able to sort of deal with it. And a lot of that had to do with um, I think having a neurodivergent brain and also some of the things I was seeing uh, in my household. And that's how I coped. But so for a long time, people thought that I had uh, uh, seizures, and then uh, I eventually was diagnosed with a form of schizophrenia, and then, okay, finally somebody was like, okay, let's hook up a bunch of electrodes to their head, throw them in the hospital for a while, and let's see if he actually does have seizures. And they were like, aha, no seizures. Uh, and so they, they lumped me into um, autism, or what was called a pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. Uh, which just means we don't have a name for what you have. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, dementia precox officially, uh, excuse me, schizophrenia officially replaced dementia precox by about 1915. Although people were still being given this diagnosis well up into the 1960s, particularly at a place called Willard, which I'll get to a little bit later on. Um, so, uh, Katina, next slide, please. So. Um, so eventually, they, they didn't know what was going on with me, so they kind of just gave me a cocktail of medications and just sort of was like, okay, uh, you know, I'll give you an antidepressant, an anxiolytic, anti-anxiety drug, and anti-psychotic. And one of those should work, right? Um, and, you know, none of them ever took away these sado seizures that I was having, uh, because I came to learn later on, because that's how I was coping with the things that I was seeing in my household and, and making sense of the world. But so many years later, I was, uh, I was working here uh, in Jamaica, Queens, and I found this book in my desk. Uh, the Pill Book, the Illustrated Guide to the Most Prescribed Drugs in the United States, 13th edition. Um, and so what I decided to do was to go into this, this book and sort of do some erasures, some excavating on the drugs that I was prescribed as a kid to sort of understand, because it was a time in my life where I don't have a lot of clear memories, to sort of understand my relationship to to these drugs. And I want to be really clear, many people do really well on medications and it helps them to become a better version of themselves. Uh, I'm not knocking that. Um, my own experience was that it really didn't do much for me. Um, so I wanted to share some of the erasure poems that I, I did on this piece. So next slide, please. So Depakote was a drug that I took probably the longest. Um, and that's an anti-seizure drug, an anti-psychotic drug. Um, and so I decided to do an erasure on that piece. Now everything here is what's in the book. I just took out a couple of different things. And so I'll just, I'll just read this right off. Depakote. Cautions and warnings. Do not take if you are sensitive. <laughs> Use this drug if you have a history of failure. Possible side effects. Most common. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, dizziness, indigestion, sedation or sleepiness, weakness, weight gain, emotional upset, depression, and changes in blood components. Less common. Loss. Loss of. Loss of control. So, I kind of, um, I eventually made a choice of like, I don't want to be on this stuff anymore. Um, and thankfully, it, it, it was helpful. But like I said, many folks do really well on this stuff, so that's that's just my story. So, Katina, next slide, please. Okay, so this is um, this picture was taken at a place called um, called Danvers in Massachusetts, not too far from Salem. Um, and this is the first time that I visited a, um, a cemetery that was left over from uh, these uh, state hospital systems all over the country. Um, and this this really struck me visiting this space, and I'll kind of come back to that a little bit later on. Um, but to get back to Bluler. Bluehler's autism comes from uh, Freud's autoerotism, um, where the word auto, or where the word autoerotic comes from. Um, and Freud defined the word as a form of hallucinatory thinking in infants uh, that served as a form of self-soothing that preceded engagement with external reality, whatever that means. Um, and so he also uh, Bluehler also likened it to uh, Genet's loss of the function of the real. Um, and basically what, like I said before, was he saw it as, for these particular kinds of folks, they seem to regress inward onto their, this own, their own world made up of metaphors and, um, and contradictions and wishful thinking. And so he, he kind of saw that as being the most, the, the most uh, severe form of, of breaking with reality. Um, and I think it's interesting that, that it, I was really struck by the idea that it comes from the term autoerotism, 
um, because a big part of my narrative was also reconciling with sexuality. Uh, one of the things that I've, ex I've experienced, and, and some of my clients have seen this as well, is people who are neuroatypical, they're wired up a little bit differently, and so they experience their bodies in a different way, and they experience their emotions and their sexuality in a different way. And so that was sort of striking for me. Um, and, to, and Bleuler described autism as what he called crude offenses to logic and propriety. <laughs> Um, and of course, the interesting thing for me is that this idea of metaphors and, and symbolic thinking is marries perfectly with, uh, with poetry. Um, and so for me, poetry really became my medicine. It really became the ways in which I was able to work through the world and affirm my own sense of self, whatever that means. Um, and so uh, it, it, that really became how I was able to move through the world. So um, uh, next slide, please. Paper, uh, rows and hands, being sane in insane places, um, was incredibly influential on me. After I kind of came into myself, and you know, I was writing poetry, and I started going to college. This was one of the first papers that I interacted with. And um, if you're not familiar with this paper, basically, Rosenhan decided uh, designed this experiment where he took a bunch of uh, grad students um, and told them, um, "I'm going to give you some fake symptoms." None of you have a history of mental mental illness. Okay, cool. I'm going to give you a bunch of fake symptoms, and then I want you to go into a hospital, and I want you to check yourself in, and I want to see how good psychiatrists are at determining if you're ill or not, if you actually are insane. Hmm. And so he does this experiment, and he sends these folks into these hospitals. Um, and what he finds, in fact, is that, no, they, they are not able to. The thing that's really interesting to me is that some of the people, once they got in, they actually started to believe that they were ill. <laughs> They started to think, well, maybe I am crazy. Maybe I actually do have these symptoms. Uh, because the system, the system in place in the hospital kind of affirmed that, and everything went back to that, that diagnosis. And so this was incredibly influential on me. Um, and so I decided to go in again and do a couple of erasures. So, Katina, next slide. Oh, and I want to say, too, um, uh, Rosenhan's paper was really kind of in line with this historical um, process that um, mostly uh, uh, women... Uh, identifying journalists have been doing for like years where um, there's you know there's a history of women being thrown in mental hospitals because their husbands don't want to be with them anymore um, you know for various other reasons and so this this piece 10 days in a madhouse by Nellie Bly was one of the first times in which a person went into a hospital purposefully got themselves committed and wrote about what they saw in it and so there's a couple of different papers mostly as I said by a female identifying journalists and so I want to be really clear I think Rosenham was just another person in this and certainly is in, in my opinion the most famous uh, next slide, please. Oh, yes, it's trying to connect. <laughs> of course. Aren't we all? <laughs> so, um, yeah, you should be able to hit uh, present. It'll, it'll do its thing in a second. Um, so this is one of these, the, the, the short piece that I have here, which is just, uh, again, excavated from uh, Rosen Hands. Paper is um, uh, commonly pejorative social stigmas see the same insane reversed. So I, I was really struck by this idea that um, <laughs> insanity was um, really had a lot to do with whether or not the doctor uh, ate breakfast that morning, that morning, <laughs> rather than um, you know if you know potentially if they're, they're what they were actually seeing in front of them. Now of course it's more complicated, than that, right? Um, but I. I this, this paper was incredibly influential for myself, as well as many other psychologists. Later on, um, Rosenhan also um, did another experiment where a bunch of psychiatrists were basically like, wait a minute, hold on, wait. Um, I guarantee you that our psychiatrists can figure out uh, what, what students you send who are insane or not insane. And so he goes, okay, uh, I'll send you a couple. Checks them out, and, and you know, the psychiatrists go through this whole, like, arduous process of figuring out and go, okay, we've winnowed it down to three. These three people that we are absolutely confident are insane. And uh, Rosenham was like, good job, I didn't send you any. <laughs> and so again, just sort of uh, reaffirmed what, um, you know, what his original paper was about. Um, so, Katina, is it working? There we go. Okay, so this idea of uh, oppressive social pathologies, just a fancy way of saying the world is fucked up and so, um, you know, uh, causes fucked up things to happen inside of people. Um, but this, is, this, is, this concept is what I've been focusing my career on up to this point is this idea of, um, you know, what are, what are the social things that are happening in the world that are making it so that a person to break from reality makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. that, 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 is, that is 
uh, an appropriate response to what it is that that person has experienced or gone through. And that has consistently been my experience. Most of the folks that I've worked with that are labeled with a uh, severe or persistent mental illness have gone through profound traumas. And on top of that, they've been sort of siloed into systems that just keep them stuck. And what happens when a person is stuck, right? Um, I think any one of us start to sort of doubt ourselves and, and, and doubt our worth and start to question our own reality. So, you know, it's just, it, I think it's so much more nuanced than that. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, I now live in Virginia. Um, oh, one thing I should also mention is that there's a, there's a clinic in Queens that still bears Bluler's name. And one thing about Bluler is that he was a uh, eugenicist. He believed that uh, people who are mentally ill should not be allowed to procreate, uh, to reproduce. He also believed that they should be, you know, they shouldn't be institutionalized. They should be able to live out in society, but they just shouldn't have kids. Um, and so he he um, he really kind of pushed for the forced sterilization of the mentally ill. Now I, I live in Virginia now, which um, historically I think is arguably the eugenics social policy capital of the United States. And the reason I say that is because. Um, this right here is a sterilization form from 1924 or so. Uh, Virginia passed the, um, the Virginia Sterilization Act in 1924, which uh, gave the states and the, gave the Commonwealth the power to surgically sterilize individuals against their will in, quote, the best interest of the patients and of society. Now, there was a Supreme Court case in 1927 called Buck v. Bell, in which um, the, the, the legislation was challenged, and uh, it was upheld. The law was upheld by the Supreme Court um, and basically said that the law supports the forced sterilization of mentally defectives and that it was constitutional. Now this has never been overturned and it still is used as justification for family members and, and, and certain um, state representatives to sterilize people against them. It's still being used today. So a, a portion of the law reads Many defective persons who, if now discharged or paroled, interesting language there, would likely become by the propagation of their kind a menace to society, but who, if incapable of procreating, might properly and safely be discharged or paroled. So this was one of the first um, sterilization acts that were put into law in, in Virginia. Um, and uh, it, you know, it was used as justification for other laws that eventually popped up. And many of these laws are still on the books. Uh, many of them no longer exist, but there are people that are continuing to be sterilized against their will. So uh, Virginia is also just an interesting historical place for um, the history of mental health. Uh, Katina, next slide, please. Thank you so much. So this is a um, picture of the Central State Hospital. Uh, so one thing that's interesting to mention is that uh, Virginia had the very first hospital created specifically for people who uh, were diagnosed as mentally ill. That, that place, that was uh, Eastern State Hospital in Williamsburg, it opened in 1773. So the first real, true mental hospital as we know it was, was started in Virginia. But the Central State Hospital was originally called the Central Lunatic Asylum for Colored Insane. And it's, it's believed to be the first, the world's first mental health uh, institution specifically for people of color. It started off as a, um, uh, a, uh, a Confederate war prison um, that was eventually repurposed after the Civil War um, as, and used as, as a place to house um, mentally ill uh, people of color uh, after, uh, in, in Richmond. So eventually that, it got too big, and so they were like, okay, um, we need to figure out where else we're gonna uh, put these folks, and so, uh, in uh, uh, 1866, the Civil Rights Act required that state-run mental institutions accept uh, African-American patients, um, even though many hospitals would not. Many hospitals refused to actually accept them. Um, but so, the, uh, the actual hospital was moved uh, from Richmond to uh, haha, a former plantation um, in, uh, in, I think it's Buckley County. Um, and so, Again, it became the first sort of segregated space. But what's interesting is that uh, this is a really noteworthy uh, institution because it has the, the, the uh, it still has all the records of the people that have ever been kept there. They were recently discovered in an archive in Virginia, and it's the single largest and most complete uh, patient record of any mental hospital in the United States. And so it's a, it's a, it's a profound um, uh, gift. Um, for us to see sort of what the evolution of, of treatment. One of the things that's interesting is in, in these early filings of folks that were admitted, again, this was right after the Civil War, freedom 
the concept of freedom was used as a diagnosis. Freedom was used as a way to explain why they were psychotic, right? Why they broke breaking with reality? Oh, they were given freedom, and so they lost their mind, right? It stays in line with the, the uh, drapedomania, which was this proposed diagnosis for, for why um, enslaved people would try and run away. Um, but in the records, it would, you would see things like um, this guy, one patient was, um, he, he had become psychotic. He was attempting to kill every white man, according to his... His, um, and the supposed cause of this psychosis, along with that of several other patients, is listed as freedom. Um, another, and another thing that's interesting is almost all the people that were accepted into this hospital were framed as how, whether or not they could work, and whether or not they were able to work free, freely of their own fruition. And so, another patient uh, was in their chart. It said, "Will not work now for free." Um, other things say here that um, they were listed as uh, some of the patients were listed as useless or very useful or uh, has learned to work um, and so this is this is how this was framed here in, in the United States and so again we have an example of how the the hospital is just an extension of what we th uh, of of the pushback against emancipation um, and again these are things the reason I'm sharing all this stuff is because I never learned about any of this stuff when I was in grad school and I never learned about the legacy to which my, the profession that I'm choosing to be passionate about mm -hmm. is owed to. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we need to know about this stuff mm -hmm. so that we don't, you know, what's, what's the saying? You know, uh, those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. right? and, I, I, and so as I've excavated and discovered these things, it's, it's completely changed how I think about the power that I have as a clinician. Uh, Katina, next slide, please. Um, so this is one of the few structures that, that actually survived. The, the hospital was closed and repurposed, and this is the chapel. This was used as an entertainment space as well as a place for worship. Uh, it was listed on the, um, it was listed as like a, uh, a historic location in the state of Virginia, and it was identified as um, today the chapel is a reminder of the state's unequal treatment of African Americans during the era of segregation and the evolving history of mental health treatment facilities. Uh, it was removed from that list in uh, 2014 after it collapsed because nobody was taken care of. Um, so uh, another thing that I think is interesting, more recently there was, a, uh, there was an article in the Washington Post about how uh, people, uh, individuals that had been detained by ICE were having their clinical notes used against them to justify their deportation. Yeah. Uh, this is happening at uh, facilities uh, in Virginia where a lot of uh, folks are being shipped to. Um, as well as in, uh, in just after 9/11, there was there were these contracts with these gentlemen, this gentleman named Mitchell and uh, this company Mitchell and Jensen, which is two psychologists that had put forward the enhanced interrogation techniques, i.e., torture, that was being used after 9/11. So Virginia has a really interesting history as far as where mental health treatment overlaps with politics and policy, um, and again just reaffirms for me how social policy is just as much a part of history of mental health treatment as the thing that you supposedly have, you know, the label that I've arbitrarily placed on it. So um, I want to share uh, another piece. Uh, this one is more recent, uh, sort of more developing. Mm -hmm. Perhaps delusions are the protective cover that buffers living from dead. You want to know what I think? I think the truth will drive you crazy. <laughs> But the crazy are the people that with the proof who can see the forest for the trees can read between the lines who survive in metaphors because living makes too little sense to not choose fantasy. Mm -hmm. Who is free? What is free? I am made to believe I cannot trust my own mind, but philosophy told me that my mind is the only thing that exists. <laughs> when someone screams, help me, begging to be saved, all I can say is, me too, friend. Me too. So, uh, as I mentioned, I, I've worked for several years, many years, with uh, clients labeled as persistently mentally ill. Um, and the thing that I've I've always consistently been struck by is how brilliant and intelligent these folks are, and how good they are at surviving. Um, I've heard stories of, of people surviving in situations I can't even fathom, and and it's it. There's so much value in in those experiences that, unfortunately, historically as well as the systems we have in place now, try and quash those those stories. 
And so I've dedicated my career and wherever I'm working to try and make the system, the mental health system that I'm a part of, incorporate better the, the stories and the lived realities of people and to have their innate knowledge, whatever that means, um, to be a part of the system and the design of the system. And so I, I think that this is, we, to a certain extent, we owe it to the history to, to better incorporate the actual people that make up the history of mental health treatment into the future of mental health treatment in the United States and abroad. And this is a picture from when I was at a performance that happened at the last uh, place where I was working. So uh, next slide, please. Also something that's, that I think is interesting is there was a study that recently came out that looked at the DSM-5. And the DSM-5 and the DSM, as far as I'm concerned, when I read that, there are these labels that we've come up with. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into that text. I'm not knocking that. Um, but I think, how many people did we have to go through to get to that label? Mm -hmm. How many people did, whose stories did we have to deny before we could sit there and slap something else on it? Yeah. And say, oh, that's what you have is that. And there was a study that came out recently that looked at the DSM-5 and, and looked at all the permutations and combinations of symptoms that could potentially result in bipolar, just bipolar. And they found that there are more combinations than there are stars in the night sky. <laughs> they calculated that. It's a, it's a brilliant paper. Yeah. And what they argue is that there's no homogeneity to diagnosis, at least as it stands right now. Yeah. There's, there, with that many combinations, it's, it, it almost becomes uh, irrelevant. Um, of course, we need those, those diagnoses for insurance. To get paid, but, you, know, of, uh, you know, I guess the capitalism is to blame. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, this was taken at Willard in upstate New York, which I mentioned before. Uh, Willard is um, uh, most famous because there were 400 suitcases that were found in the, uh, the attic yeah. of Willard um, when it was being poised to be destroyed. And there's an absolutely fabulous book, it's called The Lives They Left Behind, in which these journalists um, painstakingly researched who these people were based on the items in their suitcases. And it's the only, it's one of the only texts that I've seen that actually tries to like humanize the people who lived in these places and were, and were forcibly kept in these places. And so this is, uh, this is the, the cemetery at Willard. Uh, all of these little metal um, markers are the only gravestones that are there. Um, and they have a number uh, and they were wrought and shaped and, and smelted by the patients themselves. Um, and there was a man who worked at Willard for about f uh, 40 years. He was, he was uh, sent there and he never left. Uh, and he was their grave digger. And he, recruit, he dug every single one of these graves as a oh. memorial there for him. Um, but so this, this really got me thinking about um, these cemeteries. And in New York State alone, there are 55,000 people interred in these leftover cemeteries. In places like this, in Willard, it's, it's sparsely maintained. Um, some of them are out in the woods somewhere. Others are, are, are more maintained, but overall, they're contested. Who owns these spaces? Some of them, I've seen them actually corralled in between um, uh, like suburban uh, apartment complexes. So they're all over the place. There's hundreds of thousands of these. And um, uh, one of the projects that I have in the future is I want to try and document these spaces. Because as far as I'm concerned, these people are, are, are martyrs to the, the industry, the, the legacy, the, um, the profession that I love dearly, um, and the opportunity to really see people. And so I think that these spaces need to be revered, um, because many of these folks were never given the opportunity to tell their stories. We might never have, we'll probably never have access to those stories. Um, something else I should mention is that there's a lot of legislation, not only in New York State, but elsewhere, that make it extremely difficult for family members to access the medical records of their family members. Um, there's, you know, if a, unless the person is alive to sign off on it, or I think they're closed for 75 years uh, many times. And so it's insanely difficult to have access to who these folks were. And that is a form of erasure. And I think that the, uh, the history of mental health treatment largely is, is a history of erasure. And so I want desperately to know these stories and to, and to carry the weight of those stories in the work that I do every single day. Uh, Katina, last slide, please. Uh, this might not play if you just hit it a couple times. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to be a video. But this, it's, it, th this cemetery in particular is gorgeous. It overlooks the Saratoga um, Lake in upstate New York. It's really, it, it's really beautiful. Um, and it's the only thing left over from when this hospital is there. A couple of buildings are still used for, uh, as a prison. But, um, but I want to share one more poem. And I'll sort of end on this. 
And I think we'll have some time to take some questions and some thoughts. Um, and this is called Reflections at the Willard State Hospital Cemetery. I travel to their graves, the nameless patients hidden away by decades of shame, not theirs. A kind of pilgrimage, a giving alms to the martyrs prayed to in the siloed corners of my mind, those with which I have not yet become familiarized to sit and reflect on their selfless sacrifice in the name of insanity's contemporary plea. Their identities cast like herbs onto the flickering hearth of posterity, the secret dead who bore more lessons than one lifetime could comprehend, made to unheal, to unlearn, made unwhole, to unmend trauma's reverberating sting, who hold the keys to gates that flirt with freedom, to doors, to wards locked from within their tumblers internalized by history. Their legacy one of contradiction, memory ever folding onto itself. Their sacred bones sewn into the pages of divine text, the DSM contains only the leftover stories of lives, lives lived and deaths died many, perhaps countless times. The names changed to save the families from shame, the ash of souls scattered by forgetting. Their voices fall from my mouth, a seer searching for the source of their call. Thank you for being here with me, for listening to you. to us is you as a healer and mm -hmm. that's very touching and I'm sure that you're giving so much love to your patients and to people who work with you um, and giving them this this you know having that sense of the history to me seems so important to being able to do that Thank you. I really do I, I love what I do and I I do think it's um, a psychologist friend in Virginia uh, says uh, it's sacred work, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I think that's precisely what it is. It's sacred work. It's you know, it's love. It's a loving practice. So yeah.